Amen. Amen. You want Jesus to show up today? You can say amen. I'm one of those amen pastors if you've not been here before. I like amens. And and, uh, the reason I like amens is because it keeps you awake. Amen. So over in the gym, I expect amens over there in the gym as well. Amen. 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 All right. So we're going to do this together and it's going to be a good time and you are going to stay awake. Amen. Okay. So last week we started this new series called Christ the Victor, because when people come at the cross and the resurrection, they look at it a lot of different ways. Theologians do, but there's this one, uh, there's this one approach that says Christ the victor, that, that, that Jesus on the cross and in the resurrection, he was victorious. And it just focuses on that. And so we've been exploring that idea that Jesus, is it's like there was a war and Jesus won. There was a war and Jesus won. And there was a war between him and Satan and Jesus won. There was a war between Jesus and sin and Jesus won. There was a war between Jesus and death itself and Jesus won. Does that make sense this morning? So last week, we looked at his defeat of the armies of darkness, and this was in Colossians chapter 2, verse 13, and I'm just going to review it just to tee up the rest of this message. It says this, Jesus forgave all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us, Jesus took it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Now keep that up for just a second. Here's what it's trying to say. It's trying to say your past, everything that you've ever done wrong, every way that you violated the commands of God, every selfish act, every selfish thought, every selfish word, every act of cruelty, everything that you've ever done to bring darkness into this already dark world, If you were to take all of that, if that was your criminal history, if that was your file, Jesus took that and he nailed it to his cross. And when he nailed it to his cross, what he was saying is, number one, this is what I'm dying for. And number two, he's saying, once I'm dead, this is paid for. That's what that verse says. And so we looked at last week the fact that Jesus defeated your sin. He defeated the enemy. And so now Satan himself is someone without a weapon. Satan himself might still exist until the end when he is finally destroyed, but he has no teeth. The old serpent has no teeth. The toothless one, if you will. So that was last week, and then Benny spoke so, so powerfully in that video. Let me give you another verse that comes out of Benny's video. But thanks be to God, Romans 6, 17 says, Though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. So Jesus got for you on the cross a pardon for all your sin and all your past. It's pardoned. But it's not just that. It's not just pardon. It's power as well. And that's what this verse is trying to tell us. It's saying your sins, it's like you've been a slave to your bad habits for all your life. Does that sound like your life? It sounds like mine. It sounds like these things that we kind of can't shake. We kind of can't get rid of them. They have a power over us. And we're subject to them. And Jesus came to end that slavery One of the things that Benny had said was that our sins kind of become like friends to us. Does that resonate? Not only are they killing us, they're killing our relationships, killing our finances, killing us physically and mentally and spiritually and emotionally, everything. Even though our sins are killing us, our bad habits, they're also like friends. We kind of like them. Maybe you've struggled with alcohol before and you knew the joy of how that allowed you to escape your pain. Maybe you're someone who's been stuck in unforgiveness for a long time, and you know that your unforgiveness, not letting go of what that person did to you that time, it's like a warm blanket for your anger, is it not? It makes you feel good. All those things make you feel good, and you develop a relationship with your habits. And Jesus has come to drive them out. So when he says he wants to set you free from the slavery that you have had, he's trying to destroy those friendships. 
He wants to come in and he wants to be your number one relationship. And as he comes in and as you learn to walk with Jesus and to love him, the fruit of the spirit comes in your life. And what happens is there's no room for the sins anymore because he drives them out. And that's why people read their Bibles and they walk and they talk with Jesus and they love Jesus and they grow and grow in that love. Why? Because Jesus starts to fill the room and there's no room for anything else. And people have taught it to you wrong. They've said, what you've got to do is you've got to be moral as a Christian. And you've got to get so moral. You've got to be so good at self-control. And your whole life is about you becoming better and better and better as a person about this stuff. And you have found that it doesn't work. And the reason is, is because it doesn't work. <laughs> Jesus didn't come to make you a Pharisee. He didn't come to make you religious. He didn't come to make you good. He came to make you alive. Yeah, Spiritually. He came to drive all that stuff out. That's why more than you getting your moral life right, it's about you falling in love with Jesus Christ today. And that's the death of sin. That's the way that it works. It is not just a pardon. It is power today. And we're going to spend the rest of the message talking about the death of death because Jesus put death to death. So for right now, we're, going to, we're actually going to read about the death of death. And I want you guys to stand for the reading of the scripture. Would you stand right now? You guys over in the gym, I would like you to stand too as well. And if you were at home on the couch, I would like you to stand as well. Even though it might feel awkward and nobody can see you, just stand up. It's all good. <laughs> all right, we're going to read this. This is Mark chapter 16, and this is Easter Sunday morning. This is at the tomb. Verse 1 says, when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome, that's three women, they brought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, that's Sunday, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? Now, there's two really big things you need to notice here. Number one is that they came with spices. Do you know why? Because they wanted to anoint, they wanted to preserve Jesus' body because they expected him to still be dead. They did not expect a miracle. They came expecting to keep mourning, to keep being sad about him. These three women are also very, very important because they are three folks that, that saw Jesus die and they prepared his body and put it in the tomb. And so historically, God is so smart. God made sure that the witnesses of his death were also the witnesses of the empty tomb and of his resurrection. You got to see the before and after to be a good witness. Amen? Amen. He also made them women, which is interesting. I'm going to get back to that part in just a minute. But let's keep reading. Verse 4. But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Wouldn't you be alarmed? Verse 6, don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who is crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. So he's basically pointing to the bed or whatever it was where Jesus had been laid, but go and tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee, and there you will see him just as he told you. I love that they walk in, and it says there's a young man sitting there. Now, you and I know that's an angel, but he must not have like fully spread out his wings on him, you know, or like <laughs> gone shiny like a light bulb on him. Like he was super chill. It's a chill angel. They, they just think it's a young man sitting there. He doesn't want to scare them. I love that about it. It's just a detail. Okay, verse eight, trembling and bewildered, the women went out and they fled from the tomb and they said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Uh, again, another interesting thing. Notice that they don't respond the way that you would expect in a super religious story where a miracle just happened, right? Like if you were writing this, this isn't the way that you would have written it. What you would have done is you would have had the women go, oh, glory to God. This is amazing. Jesus rose from the dead. We just saw an angel. And they'd like start singing hymns, right? Right there on the spot. None of that's what happened. Actually, they don't tell anybody. What it is is they're freaked out. They don't really have a reference point for resurrection, right? Like they don't get it. They've never seen it before. And so what happens is they're overwhelmed and they walk away scared and they don't tell anybody because what would anybody think anyway? 
starting to sound human? I think it sounds human. This is authentic history. Um, one thing before we get to the second part about the women, there was a, there was a man uh, in Rome who in the second century after the birth of the church, he came against the church, this Roman writer, and his name was Celsus, not Celsius, Celsus. And when he wrote against the church and said the whole movement of Jesus Christ is bunk, the, very no, the, the number one thing that he pointed to as evidence that this was wrong was the fact that the first witnesses were women. Because he said, there's no way that the, the witnesses to the resurrection would be women because they can't even testify in court. And everybody knows, Celsus said, women are hysterical. And they're so emotional, we can't trust what they would say. And that was his entire argument in the second century. Why did God make the first Witnesses, women. A lot of reasons for that. Honor, because we forget. Also an indication that this is historical fact. It's not someone that a man wrote as history and as legend. Let's keep reading. John 20, verse 19. That Sunday evening, so this is Sunday night, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. And suddenly Jesus was standing there among them, and he said, peace be with you. So the doors are locked, Jesus is not there, and then suddenly he's there. What does that mean? Jesus walked through walls. Say Jesus walked through walls. Walk through walls. Excellent. Let's keep reading. Luke 24. They, they, they were startled because Jesus just walked through a wall, and they were frightened, thinking that they had seen a ghost. He said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. Jesus says, I want you to touch my hands because you believe right now that I'm just a spirit. I'm just a ghost. You need to know I'm real. Jesus is real. Verse 40. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet, and they, while, they were, while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it, and he ate it in their presence. He's like, you still don't believe. Somebody give me something to eat. You got to watch me eat. And he sits there, and he eats in front of them. And notice the detail. They remember that it's broiled fish. Not baked fish, not fried fish. I guess it was important. It was broiled fish. Why? Because the early disciples, and this is so important for you to understand, they are documenting history. These are not people years after the fact that are writing a legend. This is not a fairy tale. It does not, it does not begin and end the way fairy tales do. Verse 44, he said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everyone, everything must be fulfilled that is written about me and the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. And then he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. Go ahead and have a seat. That was a lot of Bible. Did you notice there at the end? I hope you got that point. In there in the upper room, he just walked through the walls. He'd eaten fish. They touched his hands. They knew he was real. And it says he sat down. He explained to them the whole Bible and explained how his death and resurrection fit into the whole thing. So when you're reading the scripture, especially the New Testament, and you're reading the descriptions of what all these things meant, realize it's Jesus who told them the meanings. Does that make sense today? That's powerful stuff. So here's some of the points I want you guys to get from that. The stone was rolled away. Why was the stone rolled away? Jesus had just walked through walls. Don't you think he just sort of like phased through the stone? God, like we've all seen Marvel. Where's my Marvel people at? Come on. Couldn't he have just teleported out of there? I mean, if he could walk through walls with the upper room, he could have just gone through the stone. Why'd they roll the stone away? It's so the ladies could get in. And if you know the scripture, it's so Peter and John later can get in. Because God didn't just need it to happen. He needed people to witness every single aspect of it happening so that it could be written as history for you to know today. 
That's why it was written. It was written to let us into the story. Is that encouraging? It encourages me. The next thing I want you to see is that Jesus did have superpowers. Isn't that crazy? Like, like he can phase through solid objects. Maybe he can even teleport. Um, it, it's, it's likely that he can travel long distances instantly. There's all kinds of like little clues you get around the gospels is what Jesus was capable of doing. It's an amazing thing. See, so much of what we don't understand in this life is the fact that there are limitations on us called the curse that came in Genesis because we sinned. And when we sinned, when Adam and Eve took the bite of the apple, we don't think it was an apple, but you know what I'm saying. But when they took the fruit and they disobeyed God, the curse came into this world. And we believe all kinds of limitation came on this earth. We believe into humanity. We believe death itself is a result of sin. And so death and sin are kind of tied together. We were never meant for death. You were never meant for death. Who knows what the first man and the first woman were able to do before the curse? And who knows what Jesus is able to do even now? And you're like, well, he's God. I know he's God, but the scripture is going to tell us in just a minute that the way his body was after the fact is a clue to how our bodies will be when we rise from the dead. Because you will all rise from the dead. Amen? Jesus broke death. Um, I compare him to Lazarus here really quick. Um, you might say, well, you know, it's just, a, it's just a resurrection like Lazarus was, if you know that story. Lazarus, they had to roll the tomb away, didn't they? He couldn't get out if they didn't. So he had to say, go and somebody, somebody take the grave clothes off of Lazarus. Jesus didn't need any of that. And Lazarus, by the way, he was going to die again. Jesus would never die again because not only was he resurrected, but he had defeated death to never die ever again. And that's the way that we will be. So I'll give you a few more verses here. First is Acts 2.24, is that death couldn't hold him. And I just love this, this visual. It's like, it's like Jesus died on the cross and death went to put his arms around Jesus, but couldn't hold on to him because Jesus was too strong. It was impossible for death to keep its hold on Jesus. You could amen on those. Yes, he also broke death. Romans 6 verse 9, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. Amen. Amen. So it's like Jesus became something entirely different, and then he holds the keys to death. Jesus says, I am the living one, and I hold the keys of death and Hades, Revelation 118. And then Hebrews 2.15, he broke our fear of death. And this is where these verses change just a little bit. See, it, it, it can feel a little bit like a little bit of a pep rally for like, isn't it exciting what Jesus had for himself? This is where it changes just a little bit and says, wait a second, he just didn't do this for him. He did this for us. He did this so that we could experience the exact same thing. Hebrews 2 says, he freed those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. We talk about sin holding us as slaves before. Your fear of death holds you as a slave. Sometimes we don't like to admit it, but man, all of a sudden there has to be a, a crisis in our lives and everything gets real really fast, doesn't it? I, I mean, tornado sirens go off and like a sickness comes in and all of a sudden everything gets really real. I'm a pastor, and for a lot of years, I've preached a lot of funerals, and one of the, one of the uh, difficult and yet wonderful things that happens at a funeral is life and death just come front and center. Since January, I've actually had three funerals that I've preached, and you spend time with those families and what they're going through, and it's, it's massive, and the reality of, is there a resurrection? See, it gets real. So we need this truth today. This isn't chicken soup for the soul today. This is like, is our faith real? When we close our eyes in death, will we really open them to Jesus Christ? Will we really be resurrected? It matters. We need it. Amen? Amen. We need it. 
Next verse, 2 Timothy 1.10. He broke the power of death and he illuminated the way to life and immortality and that's for us. He's showing us the way to be resurrected in the exact same way he was. And then finally, 1 Corinthians 15.26. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Ultimately, death itself, part of the curse of sin, will be destroyed. Anybody ever see The Matrix? It's this old movie, right? Like, I'm a pastor. I'm not supposed to recommend The Matrix to you. <laughs> but I'm just going to refer to this story because it's, it had this powerful picture in it, and I'm a, I'm a bit of a sci-fi geek anyway, and I love that kind of stuff. So anyway, so there's this spot with Neo. I'm going to take you to Neo. It's Easter Sunday. Neo, are you there? And in the whole thing, he's basically trying to dodge bullets. And it's this whole big deal, and Agent Smith is coming against him, like trying to kill him and shoot him, and Neo's doing all of his stuff, you know? And it's like, and that's the whole deal. And finally gets to the end, and Neo finally realizes what he's supposed to do, who he's supposed to be. And there's this, there's this moment where like they're trapped in a hallway, and Neo can't get away from the bullets anymore, and all of a sudden he puts up his hand, right? And like the bullets stop in midair, and then he drops them. And then he runs over, and he jumps literally into Agent Smith. Do you remember that scene? And like somehow goes into his body. And then all of a sudden, Agent Smith starts to glow and Neo like breaks out of him. And then Neo does this super cool supernatural move where he like, he like flexes and like the whole screen flexes down with him. And you're like, oh my gosh, like he controls the universe, right? It's so great. Okay, sci-fi and fiction. Jesus broke death. Jesus went into death. He went into this, this trap, this cage that God had created as a result of our sin. And when Jesus went in, Jesus destroyed it. And Jesus became master of it. And so our Lord, victorious today, when he came out of the grave and said, touch my hands, I'm not a spirit. I'm not a ghost. I'm nothing that you've ever seen before. The reason I'm here is because I destroyed that thing that you're all terrified of. <sighs> Come on, somebody. I was reading this Rolling Stone article this week, and there was this rock star in there that I won't name. Actually, it was Ed Sheeran. I, I, I named him. And in this article, he's talking about losing this friend, and it was his best friend. And the friend had overdosed on drugs, and it was another musician. And, and he just opened up about how much the entire thing had crushed him. And to lose this person and, and to see their potential get stifled and to see their life come to such a quick end and to know that ultimately he would never see his friend again. Ultimately, his friend's creative potential was over. Ultimately, he would never have the comfort and the presence of his friend again. And he went into depression. And he was still trying to recover from it. And I don't know anything about Ed Sheeran's faith. I'm not, I'm not trying to judge him or, or comment on him personally. I just share that story because I, I'm reading it and it affected me. Again, as a pastor who sits through a lot of funerals, I see this a lot. And I see what death does to us. So you're all sitting there with these Easter smiles at church and I get you. But I know what really happens and in those moments, in those dark moments, we really start to wonder about life and death. And we start to wonder about our loved ones and about ourselves. And it's real. What we really fear is that it is ultimately over. And this is why we have bucket lists, right? Because we got to do all the things until we kick the bucket. Because what we are is we are finite creatures that we are born and we are die and then we die and that is it. Come on, somebody. And that is it. And that's what we're told every day of our lives. That is it. It's not it. <laughs> Even us as Christians, we live as if we are finite creatures and we are not. God has promised us that if you were saved today, he destroyed sin, he destroyed the devil, and he put death to death for you. Because you will walk in the same way that he walked because he defeated death. He just didn't come out of it. He defeated it for us. 
And don't ask me how it works. But you will be resurrected with the same resurrection body that Jesus has. And, and, and you won't be spirit. You won't be ghost. You'll be real. And that's comforting to us. We don't think about those kinds of things, but it is. It's comforting to us. Like when I go to heaven and I see my loved ones, I'm giving hugs, people. Like it's going to be real. I'm not going to be floating around on some kind of cloud. No way. God is good. So if he killed death, if he put death to death, here's what it means. And here's what it means if we're really going to live like it, brothers and sisters. Number one, the great judgment is an easy A. I'll give you a second on that one. We all stand before the judgment of God, and he will look at our life. And we are terrified, right, that it's going to be the justice scales, and we did not do enough good, and we did plenty of bad and all that kind of stuff. I'll just settle it for you. You're not going to do well if it's justice scales. But if Jesus nailed your past to his cross and paid for you, you're pardoned. And the great judgment will be an easy A and an easy day for you. At last. Some of you guys are in school and you're like, at last. Yes. Next is no more FOMO. For you that, that are not hipsters like me, FOMO means fear of missing out. That was a joke, by the way. They didn't, they didn't laugh for service either. Fear of missing out. This is the other thing that we do when we think our life is finite. That's the whole point of a bucket list, is we live our entire lives fearful that we are going to miss out. And so we have to use our time, our money, our resources on me because I'm going to have those travel experiences that I want before I die. Come on. Me and my family are going to do these things before I pass away. I'm, some of you, I'm going to have these sexual experiences, and nobody's going to stop me from it. I'm going to have these educational experiences. I'm going to build this kind of business, and I'm going to have this kind of legacy. And this world owes me this because I only have so much time. If you're a Christian today, you don't get to live like that. Death of death means you're eternal. And the ultimate life for you is coming. You're just a scratch right now. Like this life here, it's so brief before real life begins. Does that mean this doesn't matter? It doesn't mean this doesn't matter. It means leverage this time to take as many people to Jesus with you as possible. Like that's, see, all of a sudden you get laser focused on what this life is really all about. You know what this life is about? It's about giving yourself away. It's not about this American dream of like, I've got to get everything, accumulate as many things as I possibly can for me. It's like, no, give it all away because that might help people find Jesus. And if I'm going to have ultimate life, I want them to have ultimate life too. See, it changes the whole equation. I can give it away. Next, I don't have to be afraid of tornado sirens or cancer diagnoses or any of that stuff anymore. Just talk to somebody between services. And they were in the hospital, and they're like, they gave me a 50% chance of whether or not I even walk out of that hospital. And guys, we go through that stuff all the time. Some of you are living under a diagnosis right now. And it's hard to shake the fear. It's hard to shake it. Let the truth of God's word come to you. Let the image of Jesus flexing on death, like let that come to you. He's got it. And he's got you. There's so much ahead for us. Next one is, I look forward to face-to-face with him. Now, that might sound like I look forward to dying, but I don't look forward to dying, okay? I just don't. I don't look forward to the process, but I do look forward to being with him. Because, man, someday, this person that I, like, love and I pray to and I talk to and I walk with, it's like I'm going to see him face-to-face, and there's going to be no barrier anymore. And my sin will not be in the way. And I'm tired of it. And that might feel like a morbid thought to you, but it's not to me because that's what it means that he destroyed death. And then lastly, I can personally have Jesus now because he has ascended to heaven and he is available to every single one of us. Eternal life does not begin then, it begins now. All right, last thing. 
Oh, that's a hard one. So, I remember going to college, and I remember a professor saying to me the very first time, the resurrection is a symbol. The resurrection is a symbol of the fact that new life and renewal can come after crisis. The resurrection is a wonderful story that can encourage you when you're going through your difficult times. There's always spring after the winter. And like we look to this story, we're thankful that good teachers wrote this story down to keep us going in our hard times. And that academic, philosophical, whatever that got me to like, hey, this is like a lucky rabbit's foot for you. You just kind of pull this out when you need it. Chicken soup for the soul. And some of you have been taught it that way. And let me be the first to tell you that's not the real thing. That is this this vague, thin And it won't take you through the hard times. And it won't change your life. Because the resurrection, it's not a hallmark encouragement. It's not what it's there for. And you got to let the real thing change you for real. And maybe you got to the, maybe you got to like the symbol story because maybe it wasn't academic. Maybe it was pain. Maybe you grew up as a believer. Maybe you went to church. And maybe you just experienced so much stuff. And you didn't think God would ever let that happen to you. And we're in the real stuff now. And the way you tried to explain it, and the way you tried to make peace with the things that happened to you in your life, was you, tur- you turned the bedrock of Christianity into a spiritual thing so that you can keep going. I get it. But he didn't leave that available to us. Jesus came and said, touch my hands. Said, roll the stone away. They need to know this is real. Somebody give me some fish to eat because you need to know that it's real and that he's not spirit and he's not ghost. He's the real thing. Amen. Amen. And that has to change in your heart. My prayer for you is that today is a day that you set aside a faith that cannot hold you to the real thing. Because I believe Jesus is here today. And I believe he's reaching out to you. Why don't you guys stand? Let's pray. There are people in this room, people in the gym, people online. You came just to celebrate Easter, but Jesus came to change your heart. And it's a drawing, a line in the sand, and this is a day for you. Will you let him in? Will you let him change what's been broken for you? Let's pray. Jesus, thank you that you went out of your way, Lord, to prove to us, God, what you had done. And God, you did that, not, Lord, not just for you, Lord, you did it for us. Because God, you've invited us in today. And Lord, for those of us, God, that are stuck in this place, and Lord, you are just a philosophy. And we've, we've been okay with that in the past. God, I pray that you would help us to see the truth. It's no foundation for our life. So Jesus, I pray that you would come and you would call us to the real thing today. True belief in you. We love you, Jesus. We glorify, we praise you, God, for all you've done for us. Christ the victor. In Christ's name, amen.